Welcome, everyone, to today's webinar, Basic Income and Youth. My name is Natasha Pei. I'm the manager of Cities for Cities Reducing Poverty. Uh, and before we get started making introductions uh, to today's speakers, I'd like to just take a moment to say thank you to Tom Cooper and the folks at the Hamilton Roundtable for Poverty Reduction for helping us to assemble this webinar, uh, which, is the latest, which is the latest in the learning series exploring basic income in Canada. Um, and I'd like to introduce you now to Deirdre Pike of the Hamilton Social Planning and Research Council, um, who's going to share the land acknowledgement with us. Thank you, Natasha. Before we begin this important conversation, it is essential to ground it in an acknowledgement that from wherever we are joining this meeting today, for those of us who are non-Indigenous, we are settlers and we are guests on this land. The city in which I stand today is situated upon the ancestral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee Confederacy land as determined by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. It is also an area with long-standing relationships to the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the Six Nations of the Grand River. I know uh, that there are participants on this call today from across Canada, uh, but, and, and wherever we are, we are on uh, Turtle Island today. Uh, if you know the traditional land upon which you uh, joined this meeting, just name it now. You're on mute. Uh, you can say it out loud or in the silence of your heart. We are grateful to the Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island who have cared for these lands since time immemorial. We hold our hands up to their amazing resistance, resilience, and strength in the face of ongoing dispossession and colonial violence. To acknowledge these lands is to take one step in demonstrating our commitment to the process of dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. May we bring that same commitment and spirit of truth seeking and reconciliation to our conversation today. And so be it. Thank you very much, Deirdre. That was, that was powerful and really helps to ground our conversation for today. Um, I would like to introduce everyone now to our guest, monitor, our guest moderator for today, Chloe Halpany. Uh, Chloe is a feminist, researcher, volunteer, and storyteller committed to a more equitable world. As a researcher with the Social Research and Demonstration Corporation, she leverages research and evaluation to inform evidence-based social policy and programming. After spending a year interviewing interviews in the Ontario Basic Income Pilot for her master's research, she now serves as the Vice Chair for the Basic Income Canada Youth Network and sits on the Basic Income Task Force for Senator Mary Lou McFadron's Youth Advisory, advocating for basic income on behalf of youth across Canada. Chloe holds uh, an MPhil in Gender Studies from the University of Cambridge, um, a degree from the from a degree in social policy and development from the London School of Economics and a Bachelor of Public Affairs and Policy Management from Carleton University. She lives, works, and plays on the unceded Algonquin land colloquially known as Ottawa. And uh, Chloe, I will turn it over to you now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Natasha. Um, we've got a really fantastic panel of speakers today uh, with folks who've been engaging with basic income from really diverse perspectives. Um, and I'll just take a couple of minutes here to introduce them. So first, um, starting with the picture to the right of me, I guess we've got Jesse, and Jesse's been involved in photography from weddings to portraits to events for almost 10 years. Her passion for adventure has led her to a number of exciting and unique photography experiences. In 2018, Jesse used her skills in photography to produce a photo series, which many of you might have seen, called, basic, um, called Humans of Basic Income, that amplifies the stories of the recipients of the prematurely cancelled Basic Income pilot project in Ontario. Her photos have been featured on CBC, the Huffington Post, the Toronto Star, the Lindsay Advocate, the Moonshot Podcast in Australia, and Kyoto News in Japan. Um, next up, we've got Robert Kiley. Robert is a supply teacher, city councillor for Kingston, and a well-known community leader and speaker. He's passionate about climate change, social justice, democratic reform, and good jobs. Robert is also the coordinator and chair of the Basic Income Canada Youth Network and enjoys engaging with nonprofits and campus groups on advocacy and environmental issues. He also likes to design houses, read theology, 
hike and spend time with family and friends. Robert earned his honors degree from Trent University and his education and master's degrees from Queens University. His academic research focuses on seniors' health and aging well. Next up, we've got Emma Paling. Emma is HuffPost Canada's reporter covering Ontario politics. She worked on the Tracking Trans Mountain series that won a Radio Television Digital News Association Award for Best Data Storytelling in 2019. And No Strings Attached, the HuffPost series on basic income that won a Canadian Online Publishing Award for Best Continuing Coverage of a News Story in 2020. She graduated from Carleton University's Journalism School in 2014. And last but not least, we've got James Kalura. James is a former UBI participant, aspiring artist, and entrepreneur, as well as a McMaster University economics graduate. He's fascinated by and well-versed on the effects that technology and automation are having on job markets and how they're changing the way people derive a sense of meaning and purpose in life. Uh, so welcome, Jesse, Robert, Emma, and James. Thank you so much for joining us on today's webinar. Um, so before we get going today, I just wanted to spend a couple minutes setting the context for our conversation. Um, and the first piece of that is really why now, why are we talking about a basic income? I think it's probably fair to say that COVID-19 has really opened up a window of opportunity for conversations about basic income as many people begin to realize just how widespread precarity is in this country and really bringing the issue of in income insecurity into focus. Um, many folks I know who have been involved in basic income advocacy for decades um, have been saying to me just how much this feels like the time that a basic income might actually be realized in Canada. And we're seeing that right now everywhere from mainstream media right up to the Senate. And then there's the question of engaging youth in the conversation. And here's where I think it's important to highlight that so many of the challenges people are really paying attention to right now, one, existed pre-pandemic, and two, have specific and often disproportionate effects on young people. So we know that young people bear the burden of student debt, are concentrated in precarious and contract work, and are the, in the worst position in generations to enter the housing or rental markets, all things that a basic income would presumably have major impacts on. So there's an argument to be made that engaging youth in the conversation makes the case for basic income both stronger and more inclusive. But beyond that, we also know that, base, that young people are a big demographic in Canada with significant voting power, and also that public, research, um, public opinion research in both Europe and the US uh, has found that younger people are consistently more likely to be in favor of the idea. Um, and we're kind of just beginning to see what this might look like, uh, this youth engagement might look like in the Canadian context. And the most recent example that comes to mind there, which some of the folks on this call have been involved with, um, with a youth letter to the prime minister and cabinet, which called for a guaranteed livable income, um, a letter that received over 70 endorsements from individuals and organizations representing over a million youth across the country. So that's my, just a couple things to chew on as an introduction. And now I'm going to stop talking for a little while um, and ask our panelists a couple questions to, to start off the conversation before we turn to Q&A. So just to start off, um, I'll, I'll, I'll pitch this over to everyone. How did you come to the basic income space and why do you support it as a young person? So Jesse, let's, let's start with you. Um, yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited and happy to be here. Um, my story um, is, is like my approach to basic income is a little bit more personal than ideological because like you said in my bio, I was a part of the basic income pilot. So I was one of those uh, 4,500 people in Ontario that was receiving a basic income, um, same as James. And um, we were, and I was able to um, see my business grow and get myself out of um, the precarious work in the gig economy and these things that you um, you have talked about um, in your introduction when you were talking about um, how our generation has been very disproportionately affected by the housing market and the economy and and the kind of employment that we're able to get um, so I was able to build my business and see it grow um, but then all of a sudden like um, because the basic income pilot got canceled by the Ford government despite making an election promise to not cancel the pilot um, it, it, it really um, for me it, it meant that I the, these plans that I had made this business I had started um, I wouldn't be able to continue with that um, so I um, decided to do this portrait series and tell these stories and then what I found when I was telling these stories is that people were the people that I had found for my portrait series um, the people uh, um, the humans of basic income were using basic income to also improve their lives they were going to school they were starting businesses they were making their lives better for their children 
um, so many really good things that were happening and a lot of hard work and opportunity. Um, and that really shifted my thinking about the issue of basic income. I used to be ambivalent about it, but then I realized that this is actually something that um, I believe is necessary in this society. Um, something that does something that is very, very good for both individuals and, and a community as a whole because it benefits everybody economically. And then just seeing like the effects of COVID-19 and everything that has happened, um, like myself and so many other people have um, lost their jobs and we're just sort of sitting at home waiting for everything to happen. It's just been um, incredible to see how, how quickly the world has stopped and then how, how much we, we might think that we are invincible, but really we are not. Um, so that, that's sort of what's brought me to basic income. And I'm very blessed and privileged to be able to speak to this issue and, and to see the journey that these photos have taken. Um, the story of the photos and, and, and the stories behind the, the people in the photos have um, been incredible. So um, even just beyond um, the publications that Humans with Basic Income has been in, I've also, I, last year I had the opportunity to exhibit the photos um, at the North American Basic Income Conference in New York, as well as the Basic Income Earth Congress in India. Um, so then seeing and hearing about people from all over the world who support basic income for all these various reasons makes me realize that this isn't a partisan issue. It's just um, dreaming of a new world order and building a new world that supports an economy that, that supports everybody. And that's, that's a, the side of history I want to be on. That's a story I want to help tell, um, which I guess is what brings me here. Awesome. Thank you, Jesse. Um, and and I've, I've looked at your photos in detail and they're really beautiful. And I'd suggest that people on the call, if you haven't seen them before, you should definitely check them out. Jesse's a really talented photographer. Um, Thank so you. James, they're just uh, on my website. James, uh, how about you? Yeah. Um, so how I came to UBI, um, so when I was studying economics in school, um, that was, it was something that I heard about before uh, Ontario came out with their pilot. It was something that I had talked about with friends in the program. It was something that professors had talked about. Um, and it was something that was exciting to me, um, considering uh, planning for my future involves a lot of uncertainty, technology, and um, all of these things, you know, planning for a 30 year career is, is really challenging. So as a student, um, that was kind of at the forefront of my mind. I was getting all of this advice to, you know, find a job that you can stay in for 30 years and collect a pension. And I just didn't see um, a path to take with that. I started working at a bank uh, and as a teller, um, my main job was to um, teach people how to use digital banking, um, how to, uh, yeah, how, how to, um, sorry, I have my timer set up here so I don't go over three minutes. Um, and that was, that was a challenge because um, looking forward at even, you know, moving up the ladder as a financial advisor, um, I saw that uh, even that position was, uh, was being, uh, you know, there's robo banking, there's online advising, there's wealth simple, there's a lot of positions that are being um, superseded by, by technology and a lot of apps that are coming out that can really uh, replace, um, if not, you know, uh, specific jobs within an industry than entire industries. And, um, and so it's, it's a challenge um, to plan for the future. And, and as someone who's just now beginning uh, a career uh, and, you know, learning how I'm going to support myself for the next however many decades of life, um, that's at the forefront of my mind. What is going to be stable? Uh, universal basic income is something that kind of provides uh, a safety net uh, for um, exploration uh, and and when I when I got it what I found myself doing is exactly what I kind of imagined myself uh, uh, doing if I were to get it um, which was you know I found a community that uh, that was a lot more my personality I, uh, I I was never unemployed I switched jobs I stopped working at the bank and I ended up getting a job at a, uh, a float center, a sensory deprivation tank place within a building uh, now called the Hamilton Center for Personal Develop uh, Development. There's a uh, psychotherapist in the building. There's uh, there's a yoga studio upstairs. Um, there's a lot of uh, interesting humans all around me, and I'm I'm getting paid just about the same. But I'm I felt safe to take that that leap and actually take a risk. And I think that's part of uh, moving into the future in this uh, uncertain economy is 
being able to take risks, being able to maybe try an online business, maybe, uh, you know, take a leap and do something a little bit uh, unconventional rather than relying on external institutions and jobs for our uh, financial well-being, because uh, as we know, they may not be there um, in the future. Um, and so that's, that's something that um, is really the main concern for me is, is how do we deal with all the technology and innovation and uncertainty and at a time right now where uncertainty has been sort of democratized and we're all experiencing it, I think now more than ever, we realize um, why that's important to have. Thanks, James. Yeah, I wrote down a couple of these safety net for exploration. I like that. And the uncertainty being democratized. I don't like it, but I, I like the way you framed it there. Um, Robert, let's turn to you. Great. Thanks, Chloe. And glad to be here with you all today. So I was first introduced to the idea of a basic income over a decade ago now in a fourth year social policy class at Trent University. But I became more familiar with the history and policy implications of it during my time in provincial politics. As the deputy leader of the Green Party of Ontario and a three time provincial candidate for them here in Kingston. Of course, though, municipalities in Ontario have no party politics, which is extremely refreshing. I say that as a partisan in recovery. Um, so for that reason at council, there's an ability to work across ideological lines in a much more meaningful and honest way. And I think the best example we can see of that is that Kingston was the first municipality in the country to endorse a basic income. And also we see that type of honest and meaningful engagement with independent senators in the red chamber. So without parties, you can have a real holistic look at policy, which I really appreciate. Um, and as a city councilor, basic income is attractive because it streamlines programs. And it's not that it's necessarily in competition with Ontario Works or Ontario Disability Support Program or other strong social economic programs like Living Wage. And it's also not that we should cut other programs in favor of the basic income. Rather, I think we should embrace basic income as a simple and single source of assistance because it promises to make the life of recipients much less challenging and cumbersome. Essentially, we could stop policing the poor with multiple applications for multiple programs that they need to have to survive and thrive. And in turn, of course, that helps administrators like municipalities be more efficient and more effective in the delivery of those programs, which is always bait for politicians, because when you can support people in a good way while keeping costs down, you hit the proverbial nail on the head of doing more with less, which our constituents absolutely love. Um, also concerning youth, I think I should just quickly talk about that though. I'm almost aging out of the cohort at 32. I didn't find stable employment until very recently after a boatload of really good, but contract work. Um, and even now my other gig as a supply teacher, as an occasional teacher with the limestone board is precarious. I'm laid off due to the pandemic. And as we've all heard, school's not back in session at least until summer and I'm not sure what that will look like in the fall when it comes back for occasional teachers like myself. So with an unstable economy, I think that basic income provides a much more robust net of support for those who are underemployed or unemployed. And more than that, and I hope we can talk about this more a bit later, I have a strong hunch that basic income will help us mitigate and adapt in light of the climate emergency. So I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Robert. And yeah, the municipal perspective there, I think, is really interesting and really cool to hear the, the action, really leadership that, that the city of Kingston's taken on that. Um, so I'll turn last, but definitely not least, uh, over to you, Emma. Hi, thank you. Um, so as you mentioned, my name is Emma Pilling. I'm a reporter for the Huffington Post. And I came to basic income in 2018 when my editor said, hey, Ontario is doing this really groundbreaking pilot project, we should write about it. Um, we ended up doing a really long-term series about the pilot. I traveled to all three test areas, Hamilton, Kawartha Lakes, and Thunder Bay to interview recipients and produce videos about how basic income was changing their lives. Um, and then I've been covering provincial politics since the Ford government got elected. So I've also been covering the cancellation of the project, what has happened to the people who were relying on that money and the research that has come out of it. Um, since I'm a journalist, I don't necessarily describe myself as an advocate 
for basic income, but I've written a lot about how it changed people's lives. And I've definitely seen that it had a positive impact on people who were previously living with very precarious jobs or in extreme poverty. Awesome, thanks Emma. And yeah, I guess that's a bigger point about the advocacy versus journalism piece. And I guess in some ways you're, you've almost created tools for advocates um, in some ways and, and really telling those stories and getting those out there. Um, so next, next question. So Jesse and James, you both touched on this a little bit, but you were both part of the Ontario basic income pilot that, that as you both mentioned, was canceled a few years ago now by the incoming provincial government. Um, so just beyond what you've already said, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about what your experience was actually receiving a basic income um, and how, if at all, that might have changed your views about basic income? Uh, James, do you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. So. Um... My experience on it um, was essentially the moment I realized I was going to get it. Um, it was this uh, sense of uh, freedom and ability uh, to, to make new choices that I wouldn't have before. Um, I was really, uh, you know, feeling really safe and secure with my job at the bank. And, you know, like everyone around me told me, like, you know, don't, don't get rid of that job. That's, that's a great place to stay and climb your way up the ladder. Uh, even again, with, the concern that that ladder might not exist the same way it has for the last however many decades. Um, so, so really, um, I was able to ask that question, like, what do I really want to do? Not what do I have to do to survive? What do I have to do uh, to make sure I'm getting that paycheck? But what do I really want to do? Uh, where would I be best suited? Where can I really have uh, uh, the most positive impact or effect? Where can I be myself more fully? And I think that, um, Something I'm learning with that, especially someone uh, with an economics background, is that there's this potential inside of uh, myself and inside of ev everyone else where if put into an environment that is optimal for that individual, um, the amount of uh, efficiency or uh, ability to actually do something to, uh, to have a community impact, to, uh, to do work, uh, you know, doing work isn't, isn't just, uh, you know, the work to, to receive that paycheck, like sort of that monotonous, mundane work that I was doing when I was at the bank. But when it's work you really want to be doing and that you really enjoy, um, there's an economic value in that, um, that I think is sort of not measured. It's not part of the GDP, but I think that there is um, a value in that. I think Andrew Yang talks about, um, you know, I forget the words that he uses, but he talks about uh, human capital and how there there's uh, something that will be unleashed, uh, you know, in uh, North America when a UBI is implemented, uh, because it gives people that freedom to explore. It gave me that freedom to explore where I really wanted to be. Um, I know that I, I spent a lot more time uh, reading books maybe I otherwise wouldn't have read, or, or spent time doing things that I other would have, uh, otherwise wouldn't have spent time doing. Um, I, I really dove deep into meditation and mindfulness, working at the Float Center, uh, you know, that's something that's really common uh, with a lot of the people uh, that are around me. And, and so I was able to um, have the space and the freedom to, to discover that and explore that. So it, I, I really discovered sort of that intangible value. And I think with UBI, one of the concerns is that people will just you know, be lazy and stay at home and play video games or something. Um, but I think UBI combined with education, combined with you know, people speaking to things like this. Um, I know I can speak to things like this. Um, it might find people being much more uh, effective and efficient and uh, uh, productive in their society uh, than they ever would have been before. And that's something that needs to be realistically talked about and, uh, and, and spoken to because that's, that's there. And I, I experienced it. And I think a lot of other people did on this program too. I mean, look at all the things Jesse did, uh, you know, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, but that, that, that's, I think, the biggest part of it for me. Yeah, the idea of choice, I think, and, and that's something I heard in, in my research with participants as well over and over again, was just how simple something like choice is, but who actually has the power and the privilege to make those choices um, is something that um, I think merits some more thinking. Um, Jesse, do you want to share a little bit more? Sorry, I was muted there. Um, yeah, I'm happy to share. So uh, my life before basic income was that I had four jobs. 
Um, and so it was very exhausting. All of those jobs were minimum wage. They were gig work. It was contract work, no benefits, um, very precarious employment. Um, those contracts could be ended at a moment's notice for no reason whatsoever, even if I was doing good at my job. Um, and, and I would be out of luck and not be able to do anything. Um, so that was my life and it was a very stressful life. And despite having four jobs, I was still like finding my income going into the red every single month, just because of the cost of living, um, was so high. Um, so, and, 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 um, so it was a very difficult existence and an exhausting existence. I'd be up in the morning at one job, at the afternoon, the other job, in the evening, at another job in between all those jobs, trying to do other things. And also like trying to build my photography business. I saw my photography business as one of those four jobs, but it was very hard to build it because I was so busy trying to do everything else to support the one thing that I wanted to do in my life which was to be a photographer and be a full-time photographer. And it's difficult because like, no matter what business it is, you require a capital investment. You need like it, with photography, like you need to buy camera equipment and software and everything. But then it's also like, you need the investment to be able to spend the time when time is money to put into that. So I needed to be able to have the assurance that I could pursue my photography business and still be able to pay my rent every month. Um, and that was what basic income was for me. So I remember when I got the letter in the mail, like uh, my roommate, um, she was like, oh, you got the basic income letter. Let me see what it is. Let's, let's see what it is. And I opened it. And I thought, oh, okay, I'm getting a basic income. Cool. I got to go to my four jobs right now. So I like sped out the door, spent a whole day working. I was exhausted. And then, you know, at the end of the long, long, long day, when I'm finally going back to my house late at night, I thought to myself, my rent is covered. Huh my rent is covered. Oh my God. And I started crying in my car as I'm driving home thinking that my rent is covered because then all of a sudden I, it was just a huge relief. I didn't have to like put all that energy and effort into these jobs. I didn't want to do that didn't protect me. And quite frankly, didn't even care about me. Um, and I could put all my energy into doing what I wanted to do. So I did that. Um, I quit those jobs and I focused on photography completely. And then what I saw was that I had more time, but I was also making more money because I was able to put all that energy, focus entirely on my business. Um, my rent was covered, but it still didn't pay a lot of my other bills. I have a car, I have a cell phone. I need to pay for those things. I need to pay for food. Um, and, and then being able to do that, um, I, I, I was still able to work and I was making more money. So I was seeing my business grow. Um, I, was, I was booking clients, I was doing photo shoots, I was marketing, and it, it was working. In fact, I was making more money pursuing my photography business and having that time than I did before um, when I was locked into those jobs. Um, and so, so seeing that and seeing how it changed my life. And then, and that seemed to be the story with the majority of the people that I photographed for the humans of basic income series. Um, yeah. Th and that just, and that's how it changed my life. And it's something I will never forget. Awesome. Thank you, Jesse. And uh, something that I think both, both you and James sort of touched on there, which I'll, you know, link into the next question. So one of the concerns that we so often hear about basic income is that giving people, you know, quote unquote, free money will serve as a major disincentive to work. And I think that when you pair this concern with stereotypes about young people playing video games or partying or whatever, um, people get especially worried about what a basic income might look like in the hands of young folks. Um, so Emma, I'll, I'll turn this to you. How do we know that a basic income won't encourage our next generation of workers to be, uh, again, quote unquote, lazy? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, that's a stereotype that we hear a lot, especially in politics and from the current provincial government who canceled the pilot. Um, and I would just say in my research and reporting, both anecdotally and, um, and statistically, that just wasn't the case. Um, so anecdotally, one of um, the couples that I profiled in my reporting, they're named Leanna and Lewis, and they owned a small business in Lindsay. Um, and basic income was a huge help to them because they had taken on debt to start a business. They were raising four young kids, um, but they were actually creating jobs. They were working extremely long hours to run a business, and they were also employing between five and 10 young people in their community. Um, and they had really grand plans for how they were going to expand their business and open more stores um, in the three years of the pilot that was supposed to run. So had they 
actually received basic income for three years, they could have potentially employed more people, maybe three or four times more people than they were already employing. Um, and I also want to point out that the McMaster study, so because the government canceled the official research, unfortunately, there's no research with all the participants, but McMaster did do research with a few hundred. Um, and what they found about employment was really interesting. I actually opened up a, an article about it so I can tell you exactly. Um, so there was a, about a quarter of people who were employed at the beginning left their jobs because they were on basic income, but almost all of those people had been precariously employed. So they did not have permanent jobs. They did not have stable, well-paid jobs. They had short-term contracts or like minimum wage, part-time jobs that weren't even covering their bills. And a huge portion of those people went back to school. So they didn't leave their jobs just because I don't have to work anymore, I can sit around. They left their jobs so that they could go to university or college, which was an opportunity that they didn't have before because they couldn't afford to do it. And thank you, Emma. And yeah, thanks for bridging that sort of the, the, the research McMaster piece with what you saw um, during your reporting. Um, so another trend that we see, see looming, causing stress and uncertainty, and I think fair to say even fear, uh, while young people plan for their futures, are growing concerns about the climate crisis. Uh, Robert, you mentioned this during your introduction, and I know that this is an area that you've been really engaged in. So um, how can a basic income become an offensive strategy in the environmental movement, and how might the two overlap? Thanks, Chloe. So I said earlier that uh, basic income could talk to us around mitigation and adaptation for the climate emergency, and we're definitely in a climate emergency, and I think establishing that is incredibly important. Temperatures are rising, incidences of extreme weather are increasing, and sadly, vulnerable residents are becoming more vulnerable because of these things, um, which is true in the global context. There are lots of examples around the world, but closer to home as well, we see that. Take those living in poverty, racialized communities, the elderly. Research shows consistently that these groups are more susceptible to environmental catastrophe than those with more financial means. So earlier you and James were talking about power and privilege, and that is particularly true when it comes to climate change. Uh, the classic and really tragic example in North America is the Chicago heat wave of 1995. So poor people, seniors, and African Americans died in hundreds, scores of them, hundreds and hundreds. And not only are the numbers staggering and really upsetting, but adding to that is that rich white people died far, far, far less than them. And we'll see that in climate change as well. So people that have the financial means to buy, say, air conditioning in their apartments, which some might think is a small expense, is almost impossible for people living paycheck to paycheck. Um, likewise, people who have a basic income could help mitigate climate change because they'll be able to make more ecologically sensitive purchases, keeping their carbon down. Uh, I was thinking of examples, local food comes to mind. The simple fact of the matter is that not everyone, especially those who are precariously employed or living on very low government assistance, have the means to buy at farmer's market, say. And obviously that's not a knock to farmers or local food producers, it's just, it's just a matter of fact with the price point. Um, and the same goes for green technology, especially now that in Ontario, anything around green energy subsidies has essentially been gutted. So even folks who are homeowners probably don't have the extra capital that they need to replace windows and doors or potentially put solar panels on the roof in a way that would go very far in reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the province. So a bit of extra flexibility on the fiscal side of things could really help both adapt to climate change and help mitigate. Awesome, thank you, Robert. Um, and, and yeah, just to that one, one thing that we've sort of, I think, heard from, from young people as well as this idea that for youth who are engaged in the climate movement um, and, and youth are really at the forefront of a lot of these movements um, that don't, you don't get paid for being a climate activist. Um, but what might a basic income mean for, for folks who want to be doing that work, but don't necessarily have an income to support it? Yeah, um, I can add one more thing really quickly, which is to your point at the top around eco-anxiety, the fact that young people are facing such mental anguish from the impending doom of climate change, which for an older generation might sound like hyperbole, but especially for my students, my high school students who are 16, 17 year, years old, 
they don't see a future in this world and it's genuinely heartbreaking. So if we can give them the social safety net of finances, either to do the activism, as you say, Chloe, or to make the changes that I'm talking about, or at very least take away some other stresses, like finding a job in the gig economy, then I think that would go a long way for really empowering the next generation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've, we're, we're running a little bit behind and we've got lots of questions in the chat box. So I'll turn to my final question and, and I'll ask uh, Jesse and Robert to answer it as succinctly as they can. But uh, for young people looking to get involved in the movement for basic income in Canada, but maybe unsure where to start, um, how can they get engaged? And Jesse, I'll, I'll go to you first. Um, it's been really incredible to see that there are movements for basic income, like um, Canada in particular is a country that is like very, very passionate about basic income, and we're actually seen as leaders on the world movement for basic income, which is really incredible. Um, there's the Basic Income Canada Network and the Basic Income Youth Network, which um, both you and Robert um, are involved in very much so. So they, they, they do a lot of um, information and sessions and, and a lot of really good things um, to help um, promote the cause of basic income. Um, there's also UBI Works, um, which um, there's a lot of young people that are also affiliated with that. So there's there's a lot of movements here in Canada um, that have been really, really good to see and really um, awesome to be a part of. Um, there's also the Basic Income Earth Network, um, which it, it compiles people from all over the world. Um, it was kind of really, it, it was really cool when I was in India last, last year at the Basic Income Earth Con Congress, um, I was one of three Canadians at the entire Congress. Um, there were people there from everywhere else, and it was really a beautiful, wonderful experience to be, you know, connected to these people and see that, you know, um, across cultures and all over the world, we're really united on this on this cause, and we we are all in agreement on this. Um, so there's there's a lot of movements like that, um, and and a lot of people, and I, I would like to continue to see more movements, especially now um, with with COVID nineteen and everything that's happening, um, and seeing like you know how the government is offering to help with um, the Canada Relief Benefit and everything, um, that still leaves a lot of people, um, myself included actually, falling through the cracks and not being able to receive that, that, that benefit to help themselves out of this crisis. Um, I do believe that if we had a basic income before this happened and a pandemic was inevitable and bound to happen, um, that, that we would have been more equipped as a society. Um, so I, I think that like, like the current events and the structures that we have in place um, really set people up to get involved. And I want to see people more involved. I want to see more young people involved in, in engaging in politics. Um, one of the biggest lessons I, I realized um, doing this was that the, the institution, the political institution, is one that is accessible and one that we should be engaging with. Like, we should consider the prime minister and the premier we are their bosses and their job is a job of service and, and a job of service to the people of Ontario or Canada. And, and we, we need to hold them accountable to that, to be able to, to serve us the best that they can and build the best society that they can, that we can. Um, so, so being engaged in that way has really, like, it's really shifted my thinking about that. Um, and so I, I don't know what else to say on that. I'm kind of rambling at this point. Um, yeah, I'll turn it over to so you, I, Robert. Yeah, Robert, Robert, you want to wrap us off? Wrap us up. Well, great. Yeah. I think that, Jesse, you covered the, the movements very nicely. I would just encourage people to go to basicincomecanada.org backslash youth underscore network. And that will be a direct entry point to some of the work that we're doing with that organization, which is just one of many. We know that Senator McFedrin's Youth Council is doing amazing work, too, and pushing the premier and the proper, in this case, sorry, the prime minister um, towards a basic income. So just join a, a group that already exists. Not that I'm not discouraging grassroots activism. I'm just saying that there's some really good outfits to plug into at this time. So basicincomecanada.org backslash youth underscore network. Awesome. Thanks for the plug, Robert. Um, so that was great. I think we've got a really broad sort of scope about you know, a, a lot of different elements when it comes to basic income from, you know, work to the climate, uh, climate change crisis and all of these different things. So um, we've got just probably about 15 minutes for the Q&A portion of our call. Um, so we've got lots of questions coming into the questions, uh, questions box or the chat box now. Um, please feel free to keep putting them in and we'll answer as many as we can. But I'll start off. Um, we've got a question from Lynn saying that one thing that might hold us back is the confusion with the many types and names of different income initiatives, such as minimum wage, basic income, adequate income, living wage, and I think 
you know, we've also, this Lynn didn't write this, but we've also got universal basic income versus unconditional versus guaranteed livable, all of these things. So Lynn's asking, how do we tighten this up and send same key messages throughout the nation? And uh, Robert, I'll see if you want to start with that one. I think it's a good point. And I think that differentiating the different programs is important because I do think that there is a role for other programs, even if a basic income is implemented. So for example, one that I've been a part of uh, discussions in Kingston across the province is living wage. And living wage is, as it sounds, about people who are earning a wage and saying that it should be enough that they are able to live. Basic income, on the other hand, is saying if someone is working and not earning enough because they're underemployed or unable to work at no fault of their own, that they can have that floor, that basic amount to be able to live. So it's a bit of a different kettle of fish. And the reason why I think teasing them apart like that is important is so that they don't seem to be in competition with one another, which unfortunately, I think mainly in the past, but maybe sometimes even in the present still happens. Um, and as far as basic income itself, is it UBI or the others that Chloe has mentioned? At this juncture, I think ensuring that the, the principles, the core tenets and the values of what's being promoted are the same is more important than the language. Um, because to me at least, and I'm just speaking for myself here personally, it doesn't matter the name as long as that social safety net with the base four of income is provided. So that's my personal perspective. Um, maybe someone else wants to jump in on that. Does anyone else have any thoughts or do we want to turn to the next question? Okay, in that case, I'll, I'll turn to Suzanne's question. If there's any follow-ups, uh, feel free to, or no, I'll turn to Graham's question, sorry, and any uh, follow-ups can go in the chat. So um, Graham's asking about um, anyone's thoughts on how basic income might influence the rising rates of mental illness, especially depression and anxiety in youth. How much of the mental health crisis is built into our current economic model? And how do we highlight the value of basic income as a clinical response to medical problems? Um, not a small question, but an important one. Uh, James, did you want to start with that? Yeah, I can probably speak to a few things. Um, one, in terms of actually measuring whether or not it's uh, help, uh, valid for, for mental health outcomes, um, you know, completing a survey, uh, if the government were to have uh, completed their survey, I'm, I'm sure they would have shown uh, the mental health outcomes were there. I know in the McMaster research uh, that was spoken to and there were positive mental health outcomes. And in uh, my anecdotal experience, uh, I know that, you know, I ended up working in a very high stress situation with people's finances at the bank to a place where people come to alleviate their stress and anxiety. I work in a building where there's yoga upstairs and the float center is one where people come specifically for anxiety and one where I have personally, um, just the last few years of my life have been so much more peaceful and calm and relaxed. I, I spent time on UBI going to a meditation retreat. I spent 10 days, uh, 10 days was more than, that was all of my vacation time when I was at the bank and the float center, they allowed me to, to go and, and take 10 days in a row um, where, I, where I went on retreat. Um, and it was one of the best experiences I've ever had. And, and I, I learned so much about uh, myself and my mind. And I don't know that I would have had the time to do that otherwise. You know, I, I started picking up books by Carl Jung and uh, learning about, you know, psychology. And, and uh, UBI really gave me this time where I could take a deep breath and, and start looking into things like that. So um, there's my anecdotal experience and there's also some data um, I'm sure the McMaster research package uh, would shine a light on, on, on that if you want to read more. I'll, I'll tag on to that, James. I think that we know um, there's a lot of research out there that, that shows the, the relationship between poverty and poor mental health outcomes. Um, I don't have a citation that comes to mind, but there's a ton of stuff out there. And I think, um, you know, if we also think about mental health as health, it, you know, it's not necessarily something totally separate. Um, mental health is a part of sort of a holistic approach to health in this country. Um, you know, we know from El Evelyn Forget's research in Manitoba that the, the MinCom experiment there in the 70s led to fewer hospital visits in Manitoba. Um, I don't see why it would necessarily be any different um, when it comes to mental health as well. And, and someone's saying in the chat, James, that uh, what, what you experienced, that's good health care. Um, so I'll turn next to Suzanne's question. Um, and she's asking if there's a typical period of time 
that an individual would be on a basic income before they achieve their vocational goals and become um, independent from a basic income. And I'll pick that back to you, James, actually, to start that off. Yeah, um, I think it has to be pointed out. Uh, it's, it's each individual. It's, it's, it's unique to every individual. If somebody chooses to go and do their PhD or get a degree, it might be four years before they even start you know, entering the field that they want to be in. If it's uh, they want to start an online business, maybe it might take them a couple weeks or, or a month or two. Uh, in my experience, I, I tried several uh, businesses and it gave me the freedom to fail. It gave me the freedom to see, oh, you know what, that, that's not going to work. Oh, this one's not going to work either. And kind of uh, work towards what is going to work. And, and so I think there's a difference with UBI kind of, I felt this difference between like playing small and, and playing it safe versus, you know, being able to take maybe a bolder, more innovative move that may or may not work. Um, and I think uh, innovation, you know, requires uh, that uh, ability to, to make those choices and everybody's vocation is going to be different. So everybody's period of time uh, in achieving whatever that goal is, is, is going to be different. So there's no one size fits all, um, but it does let everyone make whatever choice they choose to make, um, you know, having that sense of stability to do it. I can also yeah. speak to that if that's it. like like I know for myself when um when I got the basic income and started my photography business and as I was seeing it grow um I did fill out a business plan and make a financial projection that I would have only needed to been on the Ontario basic income pilot for two out of three years because at that point I would have ma been making enough money that I would have no longer been eligible for the basic income pilot. I needed two years to start my business and I did not get that. Awesome. Thank you, Jesse. Um, if, um, unless anybody else wants to, to take that, I'll, I'll turn to Tony's question, which I, I think I'll open up to everybody if, if people have thoughts. So Tony's asking, if you're in favor of a basic income for young people who need it, um, for instance, those focused on those living on low incomes, or for the kind that every young person would get um, and, and there's a subsequent effort to tax it back from those who didn't need it. So I think we're, we're hearing a question about income-based versus uni universal, um, and I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on that. I can kick um, it off, uh, which is I believe that people should get the support they need, and if someone's already living with financial sustainability, they don't need that additional support. The mechanism by which the program is delivered and then taxed back. I think that's a separate conversation to the, the principles that I was talking earlier, which is why I personally don't care what it's called as long as it meets the needs of the people who need it. Um, and I'm a proponent then for income testing. So the exact threshold uh, is a conversation we had. I know there's been a lot of good work done on the policy front from the Basic Income Canada Network. They did a piece two months ago now through policy options I've explored three different options of basic income. And for those of you who do want to get into the nuts and bolts, I'd encourage you to do that there. Um, but for me, it's more about the principles of ensuring people who are financially stressed and who wouldn't be able to get other supports, again, not looking to take away other social programs here, um, would have that support through basic income. Great, Jesse, did you want to follow up with that? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, sorry, what was the question again? Just, just, just to refresh. Um, yeah, basically, a basic income for those who need it. So those living in low income versus for everyone that's then taxed right. back. Right. Um, and it, it was interesting because um, there is a lot of debate in the basic income community about that exact issue about like, you know, which form of basic income is the best one. Um, you know, you have like in, in the, the, the basic income pilot that was tested in Ontario was based on a sort of negative income, like the more money you made, um, the less basic income you would get. So like, um, I still worked um, while I was on the basic income pilot. So um, I could receive up to $1,400 a month, but I only received $700 a month because I was working. So then that income was subtracted by 50 cents a dollar. But then you look at like Andrew Yang in the United States and his campaign when he was running for um, the, the leader of the Democratic Party and presidency um, was give every single citizen in, in the United States a thousand dollars a month, unconditional, no strings attached. That's what it is. Um, and there's a lot of like debate about that. 
I think um, I'm, I, I really agree with Robert. Like I care more about the principle than the name and more about the spirit of what it is than the form. And, and I also, I also like, I, I wouldn't consider myself an expert in economics. Um, so I, um, I, I don't want to like, you know, say which one is best, but I also think that like how a basic income looks in Canada should not be how a basic income looks in other countries like each country and each society is very unique and has their own um governments and challenges and 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 situations that they live in so um i would like to see like like however it folds out i think as long as it benefits people and benefits the society and the economy i i, I care more about that than how or what it looks like um yeah and, and I hope I, that answers the question and then I think, you know, you're talking about countries being different. And I think, I mean, it's also important to, to note that all youth are different. And I think, as you correctly pointed out, this is an, on, an ongoing debate in Canada and, and young people as well will have different opinions on what this should look like. And I think that they're important conversations because, you know, they're, they're important. And, and I think I'll, I'll follow up. I'm kind of skipping through the chat a little bit, but this is a follow up to that that I'll kick over to you, Emma. Um, Jamie's asking, which is more politically um, sellable or feasible, a universal basic income or one that's income based? So what are, what are your thoughts from what you've seen? Um, I actually think that's a pretty easy answer as to what's more politically sellable is that people who don't need it um, would not receive it. If you're over a certain income threshold, um, you shouldn't receive it if you're trying to make it popular for the masses. There's already resistance, just the idea of giving out money. Um, you know, governments don't want to increase even social assistance rates that are totally not livable. So I would definitely say there should be like a cutoff if um, people want the majority of Canadians to take an interest. Thank you. Um, so I'll move over to a question from Melanie. So Melanie's asking, while the movement is primarily focused on advocating for the implementation of a basic income, how do we ensure that there's trust in any future, future programs to come? I think this may be a key caveat to help increase momentum as participants in Ontario saw the pilot cut prematurely. Um, so a question of trust, um, and I think, I think any of you might be well placed to speak on that. Do you wanna actually start on that, Emma? So trust in government? Yeah, um, I will. and I. I'm not even sure if that's something that advocates can necessarily answer. That's something that the governments have to answer for. Um, I did see that some people who had been on basic income, especially in Thunder Bay when I went there, um, they just felt like they had been, to be frank, totally screwed over. Like they had been promised three years. It was a contract. Um, the incoming government had promised during the election campaign not to cut it to see the results um, and they just went back on that anyways um, that definitely damaged the trust that the participants had with not just the provincial government or the pcs but just authority and and governments in general um, and that would be something that would have to be answered from a policy standpoint i think like how can it be made permanent how can it be made so that future governments can't roll it back or do away with it altogether? But something like universal programs that people rely on tend to become quite popular. Like that's why in Canada, it's not easy to try and privatize part of healthcare because Canadians have become so proud of universal healthcare. So if it lasted for long enough, perhaps um, it would become very difficult to undo. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I'd jump in for one second, if you don't mind, Chloe, which is to say, let's stop doing pilot projects. Let's make it official and start it somewhere. It might mean that we don't have it across the whole country at once. Just like Medicare, Emma brings up, start in Saskatchewan. Why not start basic income in Canada in Prince Edward Island, where all parties in the provincial legislature support basic income, and then from there grow it across the country. But if we begin by choosing a small pocket of the population in one province and build it as a pilot project, I think it makes it much easier for a government of any stripe, frankly, to say, okay, we're not going to continue because we're just trying it out. Let's just go for it. And it might be a regional approach to start, but it's something that can grow across the country from there. 
And also mm -hmm. to to tack on to um, Robert's question, I, I fully agree where we don't need to be doing pilots anymore. There have been numerous basic income pilots that have taken place over the last century um, all over the world. Um, two pilots in Canada, the Manitoba pilot and the Ontario pilot, both of it, which have been mentioned here. So and, and also like it's not a very um, it's not. The basic income as an idea and a principle um, does not have a political affiliation. Um, I, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, it was very much embraced by conservatives. Um, Milton Friedman loved the idea of a basic income. And in fact, Richard Nixon um, almost implemented a basic income in the United States. A Republican um, almost implemented a basic income, um, but was uh, shut down by the Democrats in the Senate, um, which I find fascinating. Um, and, th and then, you know, in Ontario, it was piloted by the Liberal government for a completely different reasons. Um, I, I think that we are done with pilots. I would like to see an actual basic income implemented because the research is there and the stories are there that show us that this does actually work and it does help people and people work harder and benefit society better when they have a basic income. Okay, on, the, on Jesse's call for no more pilots, um, I'm looking at the time and, and we're, we're just about at the end of the discussion. So thank you so much to our presenters and everyone who attended this webinar today for your thoughtful questions, um, which we didn't get to all of them. So I'm sorry for that, but there were lots coming in. Um, it's really encouraging to see sort of every, everything all the panelists are doing, but also, um, you know, all the folks who are attending and engaging, especially at this really pivotal time. So I'll, I'll wrap, I'll turn it over to uh, Natasha to, to close us off for today. Thanks very much, Chloe. Um, and to um, everybody who joined us today, uh, we will continue our Tamarack weekly webinars in June with our webinar Wednesday. Uh, so you can join us for free webinars and live podcasts on community change every Wednesday this month or in the coming months. Um, the full list is available at www.tamarackcommunity.ca slash event listing. Um, and one more big thank you uh, to everybody for learning with us today. Please send your questions, comments, and feedback about this webinar to me um, at natasha at tamarackcommunity.ca. We're always trying to improve the experience. Mm -hmm.